Good evening, everybody. I'm Larry Carroll. Thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, we are just about to launch this thing officially, and I'd like to welcome you right now to the second annual Striving for Excellence Awards and Benefit Dinner. I'm sure you have already recognized more than a few faces up here on the head table, but prior to their introduction, we want to get everybody settled for the meal and whatnot, and so before we really seriously begin to eat, and just for the purposes of our meeting here tonight, the salad does not count. So if you have not prayed yet, no red faces in here, uh, now is our opportunity. Let's all take a moment for a little personal reflection and silent prayer as we begin our dinner tonight. Amen. This is going to be a fantastic evening. We have an incredible keynote speaker, and we have some honorees here from whom you will hear that uh, are truly inspirational personalities in this marketplace and to this industry. And I think you're going to find it a very, very fulfilling and full evening. But uh, before the evening gets full, let's get our stomachs full. Enjoy your dinner. We'll be back momentarily. Take care. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it says here, I would like to introduce the dais. <laughs> to my far right, no, in the back of the room um, is a, the general assignment reporter from KABC TV in red, making a grand entrance. Ladies and gentlemen, Trisha Takasugi. You, of course, are going to hear more about our honorees tonight when we actually begin the awards um, presentation. But next to, next to Tricia is Rick Garcia, sports anchor for KTTV Fox 11 News. And next to Rick, we have the uh, immortal Mark Brown. Mark is, uh, Mark is a rising star and a, and a close personal friend of mine. Uh, he used to be a weekend anchor and reporter for KBC television. But in case you don't know it, Mark is now going to be the 6 p.m. anchor for Channel 7 Eyewitness News. My man. Yes. Now, we could go on about that. And y'all could be standing up here cheering and clapping for about half an hour. But we have other things to do. Next to him, we have Carlos Amezcua, the co-anchor of KTLA's fabulous morning news. Carlos. <laughs> Sitting next to Carlos, a role model of mine and a friend, Fernell Chapman, the general assignment reporter from KNBC. <laughs> Fernell is, uh, is also receiving the Mal Good Award for Lifetime Achievement tonight. And the lady sitting right next to him is our mistress of ceremonies, and I'm going to save her for last, as we do with the best. My far left, down the other end, we have Randy Wilburn, who is the grandson of the late Mal Good, here to accept an award on his grandfather's behalf. Mal Good, by the way, if you don't already know, is among the first African-American television journalists who paved the way for all of us to follow in many, many ways. Next to Randy is the lovely Elizabeth Fong Sung, the best known for her role as Lawn on the CBS soap opera, The Young and the Restless. And skipping my chair, next we have the man who gets more airtime even than me. <laughs> the legendary John Mack, the president of the Los Angeles Urban League. And uh, sitting next to uh, John is a bespangled young lady whom I first met uh, some years ago at, uh, when I was at Channel 7. And she was intent and focused not only on getting into the news business, but on making a difference in the news business. Nobody tried harder than this young lady. Nobody in this business today tries harder than this young lady. And through the experiences that she had in trying to find a niche in television news, she saw some things that were missing. 
She saw some issues that needed to be addressed. She saw that there were people out there who needed a specific mode of help, something that wasn't out there for them. And as a result of all of that, she put all of that energy that she had put in trying to get into the television news business and directed it toward creating that set of tools, that infrastructure, that organization which has brought us all here together today. And I will never forget the day, the first day she came into my office and we began talking about getting in the news business and I said, why? Um, but we all know why, and we all know why we're here, and we are here because of the founder and president of the Minorities and Broadcasting Training Program, Patrice Williams. And I think you all know the man next to Patrice with a career in journalism now in its fifth decade. He has established himself as a leader in electronic news reporting, indeed in journalism as a whole. Since 1962, when he first joined CBS News, he has handled some of the most challenging assignments in journalism and done it with aplomb and excellence. His day-to-day -day commitment to substance, fair and accurate news reporting, diversifying the newsroom, and his tough and active style has brought him to a position of respect that no one can deny or approach. Part of that style we're going to witness later on tonight during our keynote address, ladies and gentlemen, from the CBS Evening News anchor, Dan Rather. And now, without any further ado, adieu, adieu. Tonight's Mistress of Ceremonies is a multi-award winning BMI, ASCAP, and Grammy Award singing songwriter. Her music has been performed by such legends as Aretha Franklin, Grover Washington Jr., Nancy Wil Wilson, Phoebe Snow, Al Green. Has Tiny Tim done anything? Tiny Tim? We'll have to get him tiptoe. That was yours. See? Multifaceted. She's recorded with Take Six. She's done Handel's Messiah, Patrice Russian, and the NBA's Wayman Tisdale, who, by the way, is a recording artist as well. She's most recently been singing and dancing as Smitty in the Broadway-bound production of How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying, starring Matthew Broderick. From commercial jingles to films and television, she's done it all, but she hasn't done this dinner, but tonight she's going to do that. But you may know her best as Robin in Hanging with Mr. Cooper and Jalisa on a Different World. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our Mistress of Ceremonies, Don Lewis. Thank you. Thank you, Larry, for that wonderful introduction. I'd really like to get another round of applause for our wonderful entertainment this evening. His voice is just beautiful. And something else that I was not asked to say, but I wanted to compliment the serving staff this evening. Uh, we were talking up here in the dais, trying to acknowledge and comment on how pleasant you all have been, and your, your smiles and your cheerfulness and your comments tonight are greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Very much. Now, to get on with this evening, I know most of us have had pretty long days already, but I can stand here and either talk and drag this out or we can get on with it. What do you think? <laughs> what do you think? We all look so lovely. At this time, I'd like to introduce Miss Patrice Williams. Patrice? Thank you, Don, and thank you all for coming. Uh, when Minorities in Broadcasting was formed a couple of years ago, we had a single vision that was to diversify the newsroom and to create an atmosphere where, where hardworking and creative individuals would have the same opportunities as everyone else to hone their skills in a professional atmosphere. Minorities in Broadcasting is a nonprofit organization whose purpose is to help fund on the job training for college graduates in the fields of radio and television broadcasting, journalism, and news management, which is on its way. According to USA Today this is, and the Society of Professional Journalists, minorities only make up about 18.2 percent of broadcast journalists. Well, we're here today, as we hope you are, to challenge that percentage and to challenge ourselves. 
At this time, I'd like to introduce the trainees that we've selected. Uh, these ladies have been selected from over 100 applications. They will be the class of 1995. Uh, not all of them are here, however. Some of them are still out of state and weren't able to make it. Uh, but I'd like to introduce you to the ladies that are here today. Um, currently, these ladies will be placed as reporter trainees, as many as we can possibly afford to place. At this time, I would like to have all of the ladies stand up and introduce themselves. Thank you. These are the trainees that we will be placing, 95 and early 96. At this time, I'd like for all of them to introduce themselves and say where they're from. Thank you. Now, if you wish to learn more about this program and participate in any way, please see me or any of the volunteers afterwards, or you can look up the information in your journal. Now, here's Don. The honorees in attendance tonight all share the same qualities, commitment to their craft in an uncompromising fashion. They're striving for excellence in all aspects of their lives, their strong ethics, and most importantly, their continued outreach to the communities they serve. Now with that, I would like to introduce our first presenter for this evening, a very dashing, debonair, handsome young man who has done more for the community than I can even begin to mention to you, Mr. John Mack. President of the Urban League. Under his leadership, the Los Angeles Urban League has become one of the most successful nonprofit community organizations. Please welcome Mr. John Mack. Thank you, Don. Let's do that again. <laughs> uh, to our distinguished dais guests, um, ladies and gentlemen, friends of the Minority Broadcasting, uh, Broadcasters in Training Program. My, I have a real distinct honor and pleasure for presenting to two of the distinguished achievers, people who've demonstrated professional excellence and indeed all of the wonderful qualities that I think each of us can agree is essential for successful people in this industry. Carlos Amesqua is our first honoree he, this evening, he co-anchors the KTLA Morning News. For those of you who are up early in the morning, you see Carlos every morning doing his thing. He's a journalist with both network and local experience. During his 20-year television career, Carlos has held anchor reporter positions in Los Angeles, San Diego, New York, and Denver. Carlos has covered stories around the world, interviewed ex-President George Bush, reported live from Hurricane Gloria. His journalistic skills have won him three Emmys and several press club awards. Carlos has appeared on the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. Uh, <laughs> Carlos is older than I thought he was. <laughs> NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. HBO's America Undercover and America's Most Wanted. In case you're wondering, they let him out on fur furlough this evening. And I hope we don't keep you out too late, Carlos. At this time, I would like to present this Striving for Excellence Award to Carlos Amesqua, KTLA Morning News. The next person whom I have the honor and pleasure of presenting the award to, it's very special because I know him personally. Um, 
And I thought Larry Carroll was going to steal all of my lines a little earlier in, in introducing him. But Mark Brown, KABC TV Eyewitness News. Mark is the weekend anchor and reporter for Eyewitness News. Throughout his broadcasting career since 1984, he's won four Emmys, a Golden Mic, Associated Press, and Radio and Television News Directors Association, Award for Excellence in TV Reporting. Mark is also, in addition to being an outstanding uh, broadcast journalist, is a person who is very much involved and active in the community. He truly is a brother who is not forgotten from whence he came, both as a speaker in public schools, as an advisor and role model for youth in South Central Los Angeles and in other parts of the city. Uh, Mark was born and raised here in Los Angeles, and as Larry alluded, it's even more special this evening that we present this award. And I have to tell you, Pat Patrice has more vision than anybody I know, because when she planned this event a year ago, she knew that it would be just a few days before Mark begins his new assignment <laughs> as, as co-anchor with Laura Diaz of KBC Eyewitness News, 6 o'clock evening, every day, Monday through Friday, not weekend. Mark Brown, this is a great, great pleasure and honor. A truly deserving brother. And I have to tell you, and this is, and, and th 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 this is not on the script or on the thing, and I'm not gonna get too crazy on you here in terms of time, but I have to say this, it's really a special honor and privilege, and it makes my heart feel good, and some others of us who have really fought to try to advance opportunities in the newsrooms, television newsrooms around this city, for minorities in general, and certainly from the Urban League's vantage point in mind, the African American community in particular. We fought long and hard for many years to get anchors on a daily basis. And this is even more significant in terms of Mark being the first African-American male anchor with KBC, with a network affiliated station in this city. Mark, congratulations, you're truly deserving. And I also commend Alan Nesbitt and his colleagues at KBC for having the vision and the courage to make the move. Congratulations. Wonderful. Congratulations again, Mark. You know, when you watch the news, you watch television day in, day out, and most of the reporters and the anchors, they're so well-spoken, they're so eloquent, they're never at a loss for words. It's funny, you guys are kind of quiet in real life, huh? <laughs> no script, nothing to say. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to sit down now. Oh, I'll write something. Who's winning it? You're winning awards next. I'll have a little something written out for you to say. Like, thank you. No. <laughs> now, I know this means a lot, very, very much, to all the honorees this evening. I'd like to introduce our next presenter, who stars on the number one soap opera. I like one life to live, but that's another story. You may also remember her from the film The Joy Luck Club. Currently, she is directing a film based on her life with her brother who died of AIDS but inspired her to pursue her dreams of a career in the arts. Please welcome Young and the Restless star, Elizabeth Fong Sung. Good evening, everyone. I'm so honored to be here tonight. I mean, a, a year and a half ago when I met Patrice, I had no idea that I would be invited to such a meaningful event. And I'm doubly honored to make the following introduction. Rick Garcia has been a weekday sports anchor for KTTV's Fox News at 10 since 1987. Fox News at 10 has received several Emmy Awards as the best 50-minute daily newscast. Garcia also anchored and executive produced KTTV's top-rated post-game wrap-up, Fox Overtime, during the regular 1994 NFL season. He offers comprehensive highlights and scores, along with behind-the-scenes updates and field reports. In 1994, Garcia received an award from the Greater Los Angeles Press Club for Best Sports Reporting. 
His other awards include an Emmy and Iris Award for Best Sports Programming. Let's take a look at some of his highlights. All right, Rick Garcia is back, and Nomo showed him. Yeah, and uh, you know, two countries at economic odds coming together for the baseball game, mm -hmm. and it's kind of neat. Hideo Nomo was all the rage at the 67th annual Major League All-Star Game, and it was 120 degrees on the field in Arlington, Texas. You had to be creative in order to keep cool. Now, uh, here may be uh, baseball's new savior, Hideo Nomo. The Dodger rookie had three strikeouts tonight as uh, the National League's starting pitcher. They started the year 7-0, and it looked like a cinch to go to the Super Bowl. Now, nine weeks later, the San Diego Chargers would be happy with any kind of a victory. Today, they were at New York, home to the famous tree at Rockefeller Center in the New York Jets. Jets quarterback Boomer Esiason was here in Bells, and folks, these ain't jingle bells. Junior Seau with the hit. Boomer left the game with a concussion. NBA playoffs. Let's show you what happened tonight. Indianapolis in action tonight. Former heavyweight champion George Foreman was picking up some extra cash delivering pizzas at the Hawks Pacers game. If you don't get your pizza in 30 minutes or less, George probably ate it. At this time, I present the Striving for Excellence Award to the charming and dynamic Rick Garcia. It says, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. See? See, a little bit of assistance goes a long way. That was excellent. Excellent, Rick. You got a nice career ahead of you. Excellent. At this time, I would like to introduce someone who needs no introduction. Uh, Please, welcome back. To, yes, please. Come on up, up here, Larry. Come here, Larry. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Larry Carroll. Thank you, dear. I've been waiting, I've been waiting for that, that line to be used, and then somebody just sits down. I mean, here's a person that needs no introduction. Don't introduce it. Fine. No problem. Trisha Takasugi joined the Eyewitness News team in April of 1993 as a general assignment reporter. And since then, she has also taken on the duties of fill-in anchor for various newscasts at the station. Trisha came to KABC from Orange County News Channel. Prior to her stint in cable news, Trisha worked at KMST in Monterey, California, a station for which many, or that is from which many well-known journalists have come. Trisha also participates frequently in events involving the Japanese American community. She also serves on the board of the Asian American Journalists Association. And here is some of her work. This barracks has already touched the lives of many people. And here in Los Angeles, it will touch many more. But the idea behind this exhibit goes beyond merely remembering the past. Here we do happen to see a lot of black smoke from down in this area. We're going to try and make it back up into that hilly area to make sure that everything's OK if they will permit us back there. We, we are standing back. next to one of the parking structures, which I want to show you. This whole thing is just completely buckled. As you can tell, you can look at the sides of this thing. It just seemed to have melted inwards. Now, Judge Ito promised the jury that they would be kept busy with various activities tomorrow and through the weekend. And and promised them that they could get right back to work Monday morning. Reporting live from the Criminal Courts Building, I'm Trisha Takasugi, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. All right, there are reports this morning that Iraqi troops heading away from the Kuwaiti border have halted their retreat to dig in. And Defense Secretary William Perry warns that could speed up the deployment of U.S. troops in the region. As if to underscore U.S. military might in the Gulf, U.S. Marines put on a show Thursday... That gives me great pleasure. to present this Striving for Excellence Award to Trisha Takasugi. Trisha. You know, you are allowed to talk here. You can do that. I'll hold it. Just like what Don was saying, it's hard when we don't have a director or producer yelling in our ear telling us to be quiet or wrap it up. I just want to say thank you very much. I am indeed very honored and very humbled by this award. And every day when I'm out there in the field, I just keep a strong sense of my commitment to the community that I serve. And I hope by doing that, that I'm able to every day give the most complete 
the most accurate and the most fair stories that I can to serve my community. Thank you very much. My turn to do it? Okay, we'll do this. No, I think it's my turn. You want to do this? I, well, that's my name. That is your that's name. That's my name. <laughs> that's her name. Well done. <laughs> Well, no, not at all. Reading is fundamental. Uh, not to uh, bring a point home, but uh, it's just that I couldn't help but notice that uh, the most eloquent people up at the podium this evening so far have been the women. But, uh, <laughs> would you like to say something? Now, hang on a second. I don't let anybody get away with that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh. oh my. Okay. Who qualifies these days as a living legend? Certainly Mal Good falls into that category. To introduce the Mal Good Lifetime Achievement Award is the living legend himself, a man who needs no introduction. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Larry Carroll. Go figure. I'm so glad you did that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, very good. Thank you. But this is very serious. I would like to introduce you to a man for whom the title legend is truly a fitting tribute. You see, if it had not been for this individual, there would have been no Max Robinsons to follow, or Carol Simpsons, or Bernard Shaw's, or Bryant Gumbel's, or Larry Carroll's, or Mark Brown's, for that matter. Mel Good was the first African-American reporter on network television, the first. He broke the color barrier at ABC News with a little help from baseball great Jackie Robinson. And I really appreciate the doors that he's opened for me with his dedication and his quest for excellence, the personal example that he set. And as we look at the young reporters who are following in his footsteps today, I am not sure that they all really know, have a firm idea of who Mal Good was. But they need to know, as do we, and tonight we're going to have an opportunity to look back and honor the lifetime achievements of Mal Good and then to award the first honoree to receive this award shortly thereafter. Let's look back now and honor the life achievements of Mal Good, a pioneer and a true legend of journalism. Like the aftermath of a London blitz. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. has come home for the last time. The People's March now reaches the end of its first week. This is Mal Good for ABC News on 125th Street. This is Mal Good for ABC News at the United Nations. Tell Mother not to move. I'm pleased to, to do this because I feel it might help somebody to understand what it was like uh, being a Negro in television 30, 30, 35 years ago, even in network radio, because so many doors were closed to us and some are still closed. From radio, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the time frame because when you actually went into television, you were 54 years old. Yeah. That's when folks start thinking about retiring and whatnot. That's exactly right. And That's were you exactly any different? Were you thinking about retiring? No, no. How could you? What, what chances did you have to, to accumulate any money where you could retire at 54, 55, or 60, 65 years of age? You just kept on working and whatnot. You didn't, you didn't get, have an income. Uh, black Americans, Afro-Americans, Negro-Americans, call us what you will, but you didn't have those kinds of opportunities. And, and Doris, that's what irks me even now when you think in terms of discrimination in employment and whatnot in 1991. It, it just ought not be. The result of your friendship with Jackie that you ended up at ABC, is that correct? Absolutely. Tell me how that happened. 
Well, they had a fellow named Howie Cosell. I, 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 I don't. She didn't know we, that we, name we, well. Well, we didn't, we didn't get along too well. But he's basically a decent fellow. But Howie used to have Jackie over as a, as his guest many times, and and uh, he must have said to Jim Haggerty, the vice president of ABC, that uh, he was going to be a guest one day over there. He was going to take over the program. So. Uh, uh, Haggerty went over to see him, to meet him. So uh, Jackie said to him, you know, I, what's wrong with this place? I, I've been over here two or three times for Cosell, and I've only seen two Negroes. We didn't use the term black then. I saw a lady downstairs with a white uniform on, and I saw a doorman. And uh, Haggerty's face got red, I understand, and uh, he, he said, uh, you know, we, we're thinking about that. He said, well, you ought to stop thinking about it, and you ought to do it. It's 1961. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that it is time for you and me to stand up for ourselves. It is time for you and me to see for ourselves. It is time for you and me to hear for ourselves. And it is time for you and me to fight for ourselves. I want to talk with you briefly about your affiliation with Cassius. How long have you known him? About three years. And you interviewed um, Malcolm X. Yeah. What did you think of him? Well, we used to quarrel so much the first year I got to know him as it's uh, back in about 62 when he had those public meetings. One kind of hate is no different than another, Malcolm. I was up there Saturday, and I would interview him after the meeting, three hours, and he would call me, calling the police, white policemen surrounding the crowd, uh, 25 or 30 policemen to maintain order, and he called them names and what, no one would, they wouldn't bother him. But I said, that is not the answer, and, and uh, I convinced him. I'm sure that I convinced him that it, that his philosophy was not right. But after he went to the Mecca and went to Africa, they convinced him. Uh, very frankly, this is a search for an alternative to riots. And uh, if the nation doesn't respond to us, as we labor that two or three months, however long it takes, uh, God only knows what we will face in terms of chaos. This is a kind of last desperate demand for the nation to respond to nonviolence. Then there was Martin Luther King, yeah. the nonviolent movement. Yeah. Was that effective? Well, it, it, it was, was effective. It's just too bad that uh, Martin didn't live, live to see it. it uh, he, t he pricked the consciences of people. The body of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. has come home for the last time. Here in Atlanta, to the church which he co-pastored with his father, and the church which he attended as a boy, and the church from where he preached the doctrine of nonviolence, hoping that someday he would obtain full equality for his Negro brothers. Bernie Shaw, who's with CNN now, recently said on uh, an Arsenio Hall show that the people who impacted his broadcast career the most were Edward R. Murrow, Walter Cronkite, and Mal Good. Have you always wanted to be a newsman? When you were little, what did you think you'd be doing right now? When I was, I'm doing precisely what I dreamed about. Mm -hmm. I couldn't envision CNN, obviously, but uh, when I was growing up in Chicago, when I was 13, I said, I want to be like that man. And that man was Edward R. Murrow, mm -hmm. and then Walter Cronkite. And uh, there was one outstanding journalist who, who broke the color barrier at ABC, Mal Good. What say you? That's uh, some kind of company to be put in. When all is said and done, and Mal Good goes home to be with the Lord, how does he want to be remembered? Oh, I'd just like to, uh, I'd like to, I don't want to leave. <laughs> but I'd really like to be remembered as somebody who tried to do something something to make life better for somebody not better for black people not better for afro-americans not not better for white people but better for humanity and of course as of very recently now mal good is no longer with us but he set the stage and opened the doors for many of us to follow. He showed us that age, race, and status in life were not permanent barriers, only temporary obstacles. And now accepting the award in his grandfather's behalf and presenting the award to the first recipient of the Mal Good Lifetime Achievement Award, Randy Wilbin.
This is something. Um, to be up here with these wonderful people, uh, a terrific program that Patrice has put on, it's kind of hard for me, I guess, as you know. My grandfather passed away Tuesday evening, and um, just like he said, you know, he never, wants, he never wanted to go. And um, unfortunately, it was definitely his time. So um, it's good to see that there are people like Fernell Chapman to carry on his work, um, and Larry Carroll, uh, and other people. Uh, African Americans that have uh, been very prominent in the broadcasting industry and that have come along and, and still have a ways to go and that they've done quite well and I'm, I'm glad to make Mr. Chapman's acquaintance this evening and I see that the uh, first award that will be going to him will be going out, will be going to a gentleman of his stature. Uh, the first recipient of this award is Fernell Chapman. Fernell has been a top rated reporter at KNBC TV since 1976. Prior to joining KNBC, Chapman worked in Cleveland in a variety of positions from assignment editor, reporter, to talk show host. Chapman's numerous awards include honors from the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, the Greater Los Angeles Press Club, the Ohio Associated Press Club, and the Greater New Orleans Press Club. Here is some of his work. Today in L.A. Weekend. And good morning again, everyone. We begin with a powerful earthquake in the nation of Chile in South America. Fire and emergency rescue crews remain on standby here in Glendale, where more than a dozen homes were evacuated because of mudslides. Watson spent about two hours inside, an emotion-packed two hours with family and friends, before he emerged to briefly talk to reporters. I I'd like y'all to leave me alone and let me go about my life. For artists like Easy e gangster rap has become big business, involving hundreds of millions of dollars. The big question now is, will Mark Furman be called back to the witness stand yet again to refuse to answer questions in the presence of the jury? Live from the courthouse downtown, I'm Brunel Chapman. Now back to the studio. I am extremely honored to present the first Malgood Lifetime Achievement Award to Mr. Fernell Chapman. Thank you. <laughs> I am deeply honored and uh, I am here to thank you from the depths of my heart. Uh, I met Mal Good for the first time, 1968. I was a uh, budding reporter, and he came to me and said some things that I was too young and too naive to really understand. Essentially, he said, you're going back to the South. You're going to New Orleans, you know? people in Louisiana ain't got no colored people on TV down there <laughs> and I said gee was well, uh, I'm just not sure what to expect well Mal Good opened my eyes to a lot of what I did come to experience and I will never forget him I'm not sure that uh, Mal Good would really be proud of this industry today. Information is often slanted, it's massaged, it's juiced. That was not Mal Good. This should be an industry that works for people, not for money, not for ratings but for the good of people. Mal Good was that kind of individual. And I hope I am. Thank you.
It's wonderful to know that integrity is still alive and well. But I don't know, Fresnel. I think uh, you and that little yellow duck suit kind of did something for the ratings that night. I don't know. Does this mean my life is over now? <laughs> I, I was really moved by the duck suit. That was just so cute. It was adorable. It's adorable. For the final presentation and the introduction of our keynote speaker, Mr. Dan Rather, once again, please welcome Ms. Patrice Williams. Well, although Mr. Rather came here today as our keynote speaker and not expecting any accolades, I can't get him, let him go without any. But first, before I get to him, I'd like to speak about his number one assistant, Bill Madison. If it wasn't for him, Dan wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for your support in passing on my mail, I know he wouldn't be here. <laughs> so, so I'd like for Bill to stand and say thank you. The Minorities in Broadcasting Training Program have felt Mr. Rather's support for a very long time. He has gone above and beyond his call of duty as one of our honorary committee members by his all-around support. Uh, with his 50-plus years in journalism, he exemplifies journalism at its best. If I were to cover all the stories that he's done, we'd be here all night, but I'll name a few. From the JFK assassination to the fall of the Berlin Wall, he was there. Now let's review some of history in the making. Mr. Cobb drove up just as I was fixing to cross the intersection of 22nd and Nashville, and I thought maybe just stopping to the stop sign. So I didn't pay no attention to the guy that jumped out of the car with pistols in the hand and grabbed me by the arm and dragged me into the back of the car and told me to lie down on the floorboard. James H. Meredith, son of a cotton farmer, grandson of a slave, and applicant for admission to the University of Mississippi. James, why do you want to enter the University of Mississippi? Well, I think that uh, every citizen should have an opportunity to receive an education in his own state. I think he should have an education, an opportunity to receive the best possible education. We just have a report from our correspondent, Dan, rather in Dallas, that he has confirmed that President Kennedy is dead. There is still no official confirmation of this, however, it's a report from our correspondent, Dan, rather, in Dallas, Texas. This armored convoy is trying to move out of the area. We the Soviets control the cities. They do not control the countryside. Our location is just outside the city of Jalalabad. No journalist can get here without being in disguise. Good evening. This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting tonight from Mexico City. Tonight, South Africa stands seemingly on the brink. The writing is on the wall. About to elect Nelson Mandela president. Betty, the situation is since we have an agreement in writing, could, if he's going to break the agreement, could we have that in writing, please? It was soon evident why Rather had been pressing so hard to stay on the air. Late pictures of the most serious trouble had finally arrived. It may indicate some reason why the Chinese have decided that they don't want us to continue broadcasting from here. I, I do protest in the most respectful manner. But the Chinese had finally had enough. There would be no more live coverage. The satellite was being shut off. This is Dan Rather, uh, CBS News, Beijing. Experience CBS News. Mr. Rather, an appreciation for your uncommon commitment to newsroom diversity during an exciting and challenging year. It gives me great pleasure to give you this award of appreciation. Thank you. Thank you.
please. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I mean no disrespect when I note that Mal Good said that he didn't want to leave. I stand up here perfectly aware that a lot of people in this room can't wait to leave. <laughs> I appreciate your patience, and I want to say in advance, I appreciate your patience as I go through some remarks that I thought about uh, for several weeks before coming here and that I hope may reverberate somewhat, at least a wee tiny bit, outside this room. And thank you, Patrice Williams, for your patience. It's taken uh, two years for me to get here. It might have taken longer, but the program only started two years ago, you understand? <laughs> I must say that it's not only gratifying, but also surprising that Patrice and this organization, which she so ably leads, had the patience to wait. After all, when I started at CBS News, about the only way I could be considered a member of any minority was that my diploma did not come from any well-known or prestigious school. It didn't even come from a university. It came from what was then a small backwoods teacher's college, Sam Houston State Teacher's College in Huntsville, Texas, a state public school so small there were even people in Huntsville who'd never heard of the place. <laughs> I was and still am uh, a white, heterosexual, southern male reared a full immersion Baptist. <laughs> I worked for one of the most dominant corporations in broadcasting, still affordable, still dependable CBS. <laughs> and in moments of foolhardy personal candor, uh, and with a few toddies under me, I will admit to being beyond 60 years of age. Actually, the prospect of advancing age might qualify me for membership in one minority group in television, where more and more on-air reporters look like extras from Baywatch. <laughs> but, uh, never mind. I don't feel old, at least not on my better days, and any time we at CBS News have better high-quality reporting than our competition. And I'm still leaving 30-year-old producers eating my dust. <laughs> not that I take any satisfaction in that, mind you. <laughs> Just stating the facts. I expect there are more older Americans out there who can still outpace the whippersnappers if only somebody will give them a chance. But you no doubt are aware of some or all of that, and make of it what you will. But it bears pointing out tonight, and for, at a minimum, one reason, in the eyes of some people, I may be about the least likely person who should be here speaking to you. I know that, and I want you to know that I know that. <laughs> so why did Patrice uh, ask me to come out here and wait so long for me to come? Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, that, uh, you know, the Anchorman Creed, frequently in error, but never in doubt. <laughs> that I think one, one reason is probably that she felt it might call some attention to the affair. We're all pros here and we understand the necessity for that. But I think uh, probably the major factor involves a talk I gave to the radio and television news directors in Miami two years ago. In that talk, I said some things I'm glad I said. So as a takeoff point for what I want to say tonight, please allow me to quote from the RTN Day speech for a minute. I asked my colleagues to, quote, try harder to get and keep minorities on the air and in off-camera decision-making jobs. Try and be determined to succeed. Now, I'm continuing to quote. I know there are market survey researchers who will bring you confusing numbers and tell you they add up to one thing. Your audience wants to see Ken and Barbie and your audience doesn't want to see African Americans or Arab Americans or Latinos or Asian Americans or Native Americans or gays and lesbians or older Americans or Americans with disabilities. So, we give our audience plenty of Ken and Barbie and we make the minorities we have hired so uncomfortable that they hold back on the perspective, the experience, the intelligence, the talent that could have been offered by them to make us wiser and stronger. Now, I'm continuing to quote, those market researchers with their surveys and focus groups are playing games with you and me and with this entire country. We actually pay them money to fool us. Money I submit to you could be better spent on news coverage. Their so-called samples of opinion are no more accurate or reliable 
than my grandmother's big toe was when it came to predicting the weather. <laughs> your own knowledge of news and human nature, your own idealism and professionalism will guide you more surely than any market researcher ever will. You and I know that market research can and often does cripple a newscast pronto, but the market researchers will keep getting away with their games so long as you and I and the people we work for let them. If we change the voice and the face of broadcasting, honestly and fairly, on the basis of excellence and ethics, talent and intelligence, we can shatter false and cheap notions about news. We can prove that our, that our audience wants electronic journalism that is ethical, responsible, and of high quality, and that is as diverse, as different, as dynamic as America itself. Unquote. Now, that's some of what I said to the news directors. I wasn't saying anything that wasn't already obvious to everyone in our craft. But you know, in radio and television news, I fear we've acquired and earned a reputation for too often ignoring the obvious. So when one of us not only recognizes but publicly states the obvious, it sometimes gets attention and reaction. That happened in Miami two years ago, and that was when Patrice invited me to Los Angeles to speak to you. In the meantime, I may have done little else to deserve the honor of this platform in your time, particularly at this hour, but tonight I do want to try to be worthy. I'll try to be brief, but I didn't come this far not to say what I intend to say. <laughs> so I'll begin with another straight shot of candor. It may be just again stating the obvious, I think it is, but this I believe. If I were a young person, any young person, but especially one from a minority group trying to break into radio or television right now, I would be scared. I suspect there never was an unscary era in which to start a career anywhere in journalism, particularly in radio or television. It's a tough trade, can be a wonderful craft, has been to me, has been to many of the people in this room, but it can be a very tough trade. But this we all know, all of the news business is now in a period of volcanic volatility, sliding standards, and elastic ethics. Those of our peers in print who believe it is only or even mostly happening in electronic news are deluding themselves. But it is true that the news business as applied to broadcasting is in especially active flux, possibly decline, threatened by cable on one side, misguided corporate practices on another, and threatened by our own long-standing bad judgment on yet another side. Those are just three of the reasons, and there are dozens more, that broadcasting won't be tomorrow what it was yesterday, nor even what it is today. The unsettled state of broadcasting today is bound to be even more intimidating for young Americans from minority backgrounds, because when the world and national economies are so uncertain, when the pressure for quick, ever-increasing profits is so great, when cutbacks are in vogue, most business leaders worry about most kinds of risk. This contributes significantly to managers in every kind of business considering it a risk to hire someone from a minority background. I've seen it in every part of the country. When I've asked exactly what it is that makes hiring somebody of minority heritage a risk, I've never gotten an answer that makes sense, not to me. When you combine all of these trends, though, the volatile state of broadcasting, the current fashion in American business practices, the uncertain economy, the reluctance to risk, when you combine these with our national reassessment of the need, even the advisability, of minority hiring in general and affirmative action in particular, you've got a recipe for serious, well-justified concern, if not outright fear on the part of any young American of minority background. As in so many other fields of endeavor in this country, broadcasting has had some success in bettering race relations over the past 30 years, but is now faced with the threat of rollbacks. Those hard-won gains are threatened, including, yea, especially, those that give at least some Americans of minority heritage some chance at fair opportunities for good jobs and economic advancement. From my standpoint, this is alarming, all the more so because I think, I know, we in broadcasting 
have just been starting to get the hang of minority training and hiring. I don't exempt my own company from any criticism here, but I want to underscore that I am proud that CBS caught on earlier than most and put its heart into minority hiring. It was a coincidence, but one that I'm happy to point out, proud to point out, forgive me if you must, that today at the Labor Department, uh, CBS was named one of the three companies in the country that had done the most to bring in people of minority heritage, to train them and try to bring them along. But I am fully aware, I don't know of anyone at CBS who isn't, that we need to do better at CBS and everywhere else. But we, and many throughout broadcasting, have been on the cusp of at least a beginning to toward some semblance of much better, if not actual equal, opportunities. Even some of the hardest heads were beginning to acknowledge that equal opportunity policies work, that there are tremendous advantages to having a newsroom or a boardroom that represents a variety of views and backgrounds. Even some of the most nervous owners, executives, and managers have been starting to consider that, well, maybe minority hiring wasn't risky. It was sensible. Now, with so many other voices saying the exact opposite, this is not the time, hold back, roll back. Who knows, who can say what the most entrenched, most established decision makers are going to think and what the results will be. Now, despite the fact that I'm a white homosexual, heterosexual male, <laughs> I'm here to tell you, I'm here to bear witness that this is not somebody else's problem. I do not view it that way. And I never encourage anyone else in broadcasting or outside to view it that way. This is my problem. I think too often, and this may be especially true of people who are on the air, who are not accustomed to having to take the responsibility for anything, that personal responsibility is one of those things that people tend to duck and dodge. But it's important that you understand, I don't consider this somebody else's problem. I know it's my problem. And it is a problem of urgent concern for every person in any kind of leadership position, high or low, in this country. You know the ancient legend of Sisyphus. He wound up in hell. No shame in that. That's where all the dead wound up in those days. <laughs> and you know the story. Every day, he had to roll a big rock up a mountain. This rock was bigger than he was, and if he didn't push with all his might, it would roll back over and crush him. But he'd roll it up to the top, and every morning the rock would roll down again. He'd have to roll it up the mountainside all over again. We, you and I, and every other American cannot let the American ideal of racial justice and equal opportunity become the rock of Sisyphus. Too many people have worked, sacrificed, fought for us to stand idly by and let the rock roll back down again. We have to It's not an option. We must keep pushing upward, forward, ever forward toward the ideal. Not least because this rock, like the rock of Sisyphus, has the capacity to crush us all. That's why I was so pleased to hear about the Minorities and Broadcasting Training Program. It's an elegant idea and a practical one. Remove the risk, remove the most common objections, make it almost impossible to refuse to help start a young person on a career in broadcasting. Whatever the arguments against minority hiring, they tend to evaporate before the sweet reason and cold cash provided by the training program. By supporting the training program in what little ways I can, I am, all of us in it are, trying to make a little noise to let the rest of the world know that we do not believe that progress should or can be rolled back. This is one way of pushing the rock a little bit forward. I wish it were enough. I wish the Minorities in Broadcasting Training Program had the power to place highly qualified Americans of every race, religion, and gender at every level of the broadcast business, not just entry-level jobs, but senior man management, technical, and on-camera and anchor desk jobs. But even an outstanding program such as this one doesn't have that kind of power. To figure out what needs to be done, we have to examine deeply, honestly, the facts in the case. Among the key facts, remember, this is just a brief sampling 
are these. Let's review quickly. One out of every two black children lives below the poverty line. That's 50% as compared with one out of seven white children. Over half of African American families have incomes below $25,000 annually. The net worth of the typical white household in this country is 10 times that, 10 times that of the typical black household. These are U.S. government figures quoted by Benjamin DeMott in Harper's Magazine. The figures for Latinos, I'm told, are only slightly better. In one state, Pennsylvania, there are 64 white supremacy organizations. As Clifford Alexander noted in a recent speech titled, Where Has Hope Gone? As Alexander and others put it, they say no black people or Latinos serve as the editor or publisher of any of the top 100 newspapers in this country. They say that neither do they produce or direct any major news program for any major network. I spent this afternoon trying to check that out. I believe it to be true. One possible exception is Al Ortiz, who is our bureau chief for CBS News in Washington, also oversees the program Face the Nation. But with that and possibly any other exceptions, those are stunning statements of fact. Fact, stereotypes of black inferiority are reinforced daily by newspapers, radio, and television. Derogatory and untrue stereotypes of Latinos and Asians also abound in print, on cable, and over the airwaves. We know these things to be true. We don't even like to remind ourselves of it. And they are but a very few of the facts underscoring a raw reality. Race relations in this country are at a point of increasing uncertainty and danger. You don't need the head of the Urban League to tell you. You know it. I know it. And so does every other American, although increasingly no one wants to admit it. Racism is one of the enduring social cancers of world history, and it is in our own country. That's not a liberal issue. It's not a conservative issue. It is a human issue. And make no mistake, it is an American issue. It's deeply entangled with the roots of our history and will have everything to do with our future and our survival. But few Americans are talking thoughtfully about it. About this, America goes along to get along, ignores the challenge and the danger of deteriorating race relations, except at moments when the fury boils over and a major metropolitan area erupts in civil unrest. Worst of all, there are many Americans in positions of responsibility who preach to an audience that is highly vulnerable to ideas and inflammatory about race. They say every black job costs a white job, every Latino job costs a white job, every Asian job costs a white job, maybe your job. Never mind that that is seldom, very seldom, if ever true. Rapid worldwide economic changes guarantee that there will be an eager audience for such statements, and not just an audience, an American voting audience. These are the politics of division, clearly recognizable to anyone who's covered politics or followed politics for even a short time. The most recent retooling of the old politics of division entered the mainstream in the 1980s. They're easy, they're emotional, and they work. The politics of division get people riled up, often for the wrong reasons, but they get people riled up and get them off to the voting booth. For a politician, any politician, white, black, Hispanic, or otherwise, that's tempting. You don't have to demonstrate any real leadership or devise any real policy. All you have to do is scare people into handing power over to you. This is happening right now at the top levels of both major parties in this country. It's ugly, but it works. And it will go on happening as long as it continues to work. And if you think it isn't going to happen in the 1996 campaign, including the presidential campaign, I have bulletin material for you. It is. I hate to tell you, it's not only in politics that such things get said, these politics of division. I've heard the same thing from some of America's corporate power brokers. And I have an example. This conversation wasn't in the context of a news interview, so I'm not going to name the other party. I don't think it'd be a good idea anyway. 
but fewer than five years ago, well before the current drive to roll back affirmative action and other such programs, I listened to a well-respected American business leader, head of one of the biggest corporations in this country, go on for about an hour about how he was sick and tired of, quote, having to hire minorities. Minorities weren't sufficiently qualified, he said. Hiring ought to be done on merit. And he wasn't allowed just to hire and promote on merit anymore. He said he wished there were a way out of it. If minorities hadn't improved their lot in 30 years, he said, too bad. Now, reporters must train themselves not to let their jaws drop in disbelief. Such reactions tend to impede efforts to find what someone really thinks. So I didn't drop my jaw when that happened. I didn't slap my forehead. I didn't slap his forehead either. <laughs> Although I have friends of mine thought I should have. Instead, I tried to talk to him. Exactly who have you hired that wasn't qualified? Exactly who is forcing you to hire people you don't want to hire? It's not the federal or any other government. There is no federal law that says minority Americans less qualified than whites should be hired or promoted. Whatever one thinks of affirmative action, good, bad, or don't know, know that that is not what affirmative action is and it never has been. Affirmative action is not a compensatory law under which minorities can get something white people cannot just because they are minorities. Where did he get the idea that it is? Well, he didn't have answers. I wish I could say I changed his mind. Let there be no misunderstanding here. I'm a staunch believer in merit. Where I have a hard time is the belief that merit is the sole province of only one group. Also, let there be no misunderstanding about this. I know affirmative action as a catchphrase and as a policy is controversial. I know that affirmative action has not been perfect and far from it. It's had problems and it has problems. And I know and appreciate that decent people can and do have honest differences of opinion about its value. It is not my intention to insert myself into that controversy tonight. It is my intention to do two things. One, to suggest that for those who say, with the very best of intentions, those who have the decent intentions, who say, listen, I, you know, I want to be part of increasing racial justice and opportunities, but I just don't think that affirmative action is the way to do it. Then the question becomes, what is it that you suggest that we can do as a people, as a society, to right what we know to be wrong? And it's also my intention to note that few in journalism have done a good job of accurately reporting what affirmative action is and is not. Few have provided nearly enough background, context, and perspective on the current controversy. I'm not among those few. This I regret because heat and misunderstandings growing out of the whole affirmative action controversy are further complicating our country's already serious racial problems. I suspect one of the root causes of these problems is the failure to teach a simple lesson. This lesson is at the core of democracy. I'm somewhat surprised, and yes, I'm sorry, that through the last two presidencies, that is, including the present one, at this point, has not, there hadn't been an effort to make this point in some meaningful, even dramatic way out of the Oval Office itself, because it is the core lesson of democracy. It was also taught by Buddha, Jesus, and the best of our spiritual leaders for thousands of years. The lesson is embodied, among other places, in that phrase, love thy neighbor as thyself. The lesson is this, your neighbor matters. It doesn't matter how well off you are. If your neighbor is hungry, then you have a problem. If your neighbor is out of a job or can't read or is beaten by her husband, or takes drugs, it is your problem too. That's not altruism, it's realistic. It is in your own self-interest because your security is threatened or will be if your neighbor is in trouble. We believe that as Americans. In America, we are all neighbors. Our government is constructed on that belief, so is our society, and it's the way our hearts have told us to live. 
That's where compassion begins, and we know it. It's where equal justice and equal opportunity begin. The best days of American history have been spent trying to prove the words in our Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. I had a good teacher for that lesson, one of the best anybody ever had. When I started with CBS News, I was assigned to cover him, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I was new on the job. I was green as money. I didn't have any, but I was green. I was young. I was a Southerner. And I was covering some angry people who looked like me, who talked like me, who thought like many of the people with whom I had grown up. I did my best to report on them fairly, and I believe the record will demonstrate that in the main I did so. But personally, I couldn't and I didn't agree with them. I didn't always agree with Dr. King. He was not perfect. He never claimed to be. But listening to Dr. King as a young reporter thrown in to the middle of the civil rights movement just when it was exploding into the consciousness of America. I couldn't agree with those Southern whites and whites in other places who fought to perpetuate segregation and unequal rights. Dr. King brought the struggle, the words and the issues, the stories and the morals into everyday discourse. Americans could and did talk about race in those days, partly Yea, mostly, perhaps, because of Dr. King, we knew we had to. We knew we'd already waited too long. And people talked about it in many ways every day. And you know, think back, those of you who are old enough to remember, of memory age, during the time when Dr. King was leading the civil rights movement. When he talked, there was music, not the kind of music that makes you start dancing, but the music that makes you rise up out of your chair, music that makes your heart surge, that makes your soul pick up the tune and join in a mighty choir. You know, you've heard that music too. All around were some whites who insisted that equal rights were really special rights. We hear the same claim today. We hear it in Colorado and Oregon and Georgia and all around the country with regard to gay rights. In those days, you heard it about equal rights for African Americans, and, of course, you still do. There's probably not a minority group in the country that hasn't heard its equal civil rights are somehow special. Dr. King taught the simple lesson that if you've ever been denied a job because of the color of your skin, or lynched because you tried to teach your children how to read, then there is nothing special about the protection of your rights. If you've ever been beaten because somebody thought you were Catholic or Jewish or gay or because you were white or black, there's nothing special about the protection of your rights because the right not to be discriminated against, not to be beaten or lynched, not to have your children intimidated is your right. And once you've been beaten or lynched or any of those other things, you have been denied those rights. Once you've been beaten or lynched, you understand nothing special about making certain your rights are spelled out, nothing special about standing up and telling the world that you are an American and entitled to the same rights as any other American, as any other human being. Dr. King taught us that we were all diminished so long as those rights were not ensured. But to partake of those rights, to fight for those rights, to guarantee that no man or woman was denied those rights we would be uplifted. We talk about equality. If I were the equal of Dr. King, I could have persuaded that corporate leader that he was way off base. I could have shown him the arrows of his ways. I could have improved my whole country, that being one step in a long path. In that sense, in that sense, of course, I'm not Dr. King's equal. Few are. In the sense that mattered most to Dr. King, though, we were equals, and so are all of us. And that's the sense of all men are created equal. Dr. King sang the music of freedom and brotherhood, love and caring, in spite of and because of differences, respect, equality. That 
was the music of Martin Luther King. And it wasn't stilled by an assassin's bullet. It will not be stilled by legislation. That music sings on in our hearts. That music gives us the courage to go into the boss's office and ask, demand if necessary, a fair shake for everyone. And to ask, demand if necessary, again and again, until the cry is heard. That music will never let us forget that we are all diminished by inequality. That music will never be complete until we all join in. That's what it's going to take, that we all join in, that we all take a personal responsibility. Yes, this country is facing uncertain times, and broadcasting is sharing in the uncertainty. Yes, the political mood seems to be against many of the hard-won advances of the civil rights movement, the same victories for which Dr. King struggled and died. And yes, it's been a long time since Dr. King was alive, but we don't have to give up the struggle. If we've heard the music, we can't give up the struggle. A program such as this one, the Minorities in Broadcasting Training Program, is part of that struggle. Small, young, just starting, yes, but it's part of it, only one part. All of us, even as I say, white heterosexual males, need to make an individual commitment to that struggle. We need to recognize that our lives will not be better if the struggle is ignored or abandoned. We need to remember that our neighbors need our commitments as individuals and not simply as part of any legislative package or corporate policy. Times change, legislation changes. Even an industry as big and varied as broadcasting changes. But what is right doesn't change. What is right has been right and will still be right tomorrow morning. All men are created equal in the sense that our Declaration of Independence stated it and in the sense that Dr. King taught it. All men are created equal, that's right. We don't need a law in Congress to tell us it's right. We don't need a corporate policy to tell us it's right. And we damn sure don't need a television anchor man to tell us it's right. It simply is right. All men are created equal. We deserve education and jobs and freedom and respect and a fair shot. All of us equally. All men are created equal. The challenge to all of us as Americans, men, women, black, white, brown, and every color in between, straight, gay, old, young, and every age in between, of every ability, the challenge is to prove that statement true every day. Long may our land be bright with uh, freedom's holy light. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Rather, for those wonderful words. Um, I didn't say this earlier, but it's truly a pleasure and an honor to have been asked to be mistress of ceremonies here this, this evening for an event such as this. I met Patrice uh, about a year and a half ago, the same time that Elizabeth did, at a symposium for women of color in the arts and film and television at, at UCLA. And at that time, Patrice had a little card and a little pamphlet that said she was trying to get this program off the ground and asked if I would be interested in being contacted once she got it all together. And I said, oh, yeah, sure, this is a sister you know, who's trying to do some, some, something creative and, and positive that I would be more than happy to support. And sure enough, she called my office and she said, Dawn, I got it together. Are you still interested? And I said, you know what? Yes, I am. And here I am, and I had no idea that she had so ably, so excellently gotten together the caliber of people that she has gotten together, that she has gained the respect that she has gained. And uh, without knowing that, I'm, I'm really, really proud and honored that I said yes to you without knowing that at all. Uh, you're a woman to be commended. The people that you have assembled here on this dais this evening are not excellent only because of their color 
or of their gender, but because they are excellent. They are excellent in what they do. And it is up to us now to take our stand to continue to support you and programs like you that this is not the last that we see of this because we need to have more people to honor next year. We need to have more people to honor in five years, in 10 years, in generations to come. And you finalists that are here this evening, you have a great weight on your shoulders to follow in the footsteps of the people that you see before you, but to forge new paths of your own. That whatever we can do, anyone in this room, look around you, see who's here. So that in a year from now, you say, you know what, I need some help. And you were there at that dinner, and I need you to help me and get some names and numbers. And the rest of you, please don't act like you don't know. Act like you know. And assist someone who comes to you for assistance, especially if they present themselves in an articulate, in a focused, and a diligent manner, in, in a diligent manner, because young people like that are hard to come by these days. Everyone wants something for nothing. And we cannot encourage that any longer. We must remind, we must educate, we must instill in our young people, as well as in ourselves, the need to work, the need to care, the need to strive for excellence at all times, at all costs. We cannot sell ourselves short. If we do, we will continue to see some of the trends that we see in the media today, the, the juicing, the, the glossing over, et cetera. If we settle for it, it will be fed to us. The world is getting too small. There are too many of us here to represent, to allow it to deteriorate any further than it already has. Okay, I'm off my soapbox now. Off the soapbox. Before we conclude this evening, I'm sure you'd like to know how the silent auction, who the silent auction winners are. And for those of you who won items this evening and weren't exactly quite sure what to do with them once you get them home, I recently celebrated a birthday and I'm still accepting presents. Thank you. Um, to give you the lowdown, here is Donna Smith of AJ Mariah Auction Services. Donna. Boy, this is kind of neat. I like this. Okay, Tony Gilliard. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Won the two weekend nights in Marina Del Rey. Is Tony still here? Oh, there's Tony. I won't ask you who you're taking, but I'm available. Wow. Um, <laughs> I came a long way to get this done, so here we go. Um, the Olympic coin sets. Edie Martinez Havens. All right, Edie. Sydney Portier goes to Mark Brown. Ah, I knew it. And this is the one I've been waiting to say all night. The Wayne Gretzky piece goes to Carlos Amesqua. Ooh, I knew I was going to get it right. And I'm waiting to see him show that piece on his television show, because I've seen you do that a few times. And Carlos also got the Barbara Streisand piece. Okay. The weekend in Breakfast for Two here at the Sheridan goes to Sabrina. I know she's out there. Sabrina was just hounding this one. Sabrina, where are you? Sabrina Patterson? She's in the bathroom, of course. Why not? And a personally autographed Dan Rather book, Miss Sabrina Patterson also got that one. And by the way, we also, for the same awarded bid, if, you're, if two other people are interested, come see Sheila out at the cashier area. There's two more books. So I'm sure Mr. Rather will give it his best to personalize those pieces. So I'm, I guess, Patrice, it's up to you. I have one item that I can auction off for you if you like. I'm one of the only African-American female auctioneers in the country. I should still be the only one. And the only reason there might be number two is because my mother held a fundraiser for the NAACP chapter in my hometown. And she got up there and she called the auction. But I'm going to do one piece if I may. It'll take me two seconds. So I want everybody to get their hands in the air. This is Dagmar Peshman, who is the president of my company. Well, I also make sure we have plenty of minorities and such. She's German. <laughs> okay, I've selected this piece. Let me see if I can do this. Only because I thought this was appropriate. Kind of brought tears to my eyes when Mr. Rather said, more or less, this was his mentor. This is a piece from the famous I Have a Dream from Martin Luther King. I'm going to try to vocalize this if I can, so try to listen. I have a dream that one day yes. this nation will rise up and live out the 
true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created. I have a dream today. That's about 20 seconds, and every time I hear it, it kind of chokes me up a little bit. So I'm going to open this bid about $50 lower than it was on the silent bid. Dagmar, if you'd stand right out there and be Vanna White, I know you can for me. I'm going to open a bid at $75. We take Visa, MasterCard, personal checks, and I love cash. I think Patrice does too. I'm going to open a bid at $75. If anybody's interested, at $75. Get your hands in the air. Any interest at $75 at all? Opening bid. $75. Thank you. Now $85. Off $75. Good. But it's $75. Got to $85. Thank you. Now, sir, you're going to be $95. Uh, $95. Thank you. Now $105 to you, ma'am. Uh, $95. Ma'am, don't let him take your dream home. I'm at $95. Got to be $105. Five. One more time, anywhere around in the room. Uh, 95 now, 105, thank you. Now 115, sir. Uh, 105 now, one deep. Come on, sir, we know dig deep. 115, I shamed him. Now 125, uh, 115 now, 125 going once. I have 125, oh, there we go, now 35 to you. I have 125, gotta be 135, sir, we're all staring at you, so you gotta be 135. I have 125, now 35, one's going once. I have 125, now 135, how about you, sir? I have 125, now 135 going once. Twice, third and final call, sold it your way, Dagmar, for $125. That was the last bit in there. Thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Patrice. Thank you very much for allowing me to participate. For those of you who won the bids, come see us out in the front. Thank you. Well done. In conclusion, we'd like to give a special thank you to all the honorees, presenters, our keynote, Mr. Dan Rather, and to our sponsors and supporters, Mal Good, CBS Entertainment, KABC TV, KTTV Fox 11, KNBC TV, Sony Pictures, MCA Universal, KCBS TV, Treva Wilson and Associates, Exotic Flowers of Paradise. What the flowers lovely on the table? Oh, wait, I got to show you my flowers. They gave me flowers tonight. I'm very proud of these. I love these. Wait a minute. <laughs> Are these gorgeous or what? Who are? Exotic Flowers of Paradise, Steve Smith and KNX Radio, Sean Holt, the Sean Holt Quartet, Boulevard Cafe, the Mellon Financial Group, Donna Smith and AJ Mariah, Bill Madison, Barbara Wager, Robert Young, Brenda White, Carver Shannon, Barbara Sullivan, Tom Songster, Robert Good, Phyllis Warren, Erica Williams, Victor Allen, Edward McMillan, Frank Rotold, PM Productions, Bill Doggett, our photographer, Disney Volunteers, Amy Bennett, and all of you. And there's one group of people that were not acknowledged, the spouses of the people on our dais this evening. Will the spouses, any companions or spouses, please stand. Thank you so much for your support because I'm sure, uh, well hopefully I'm not sure, but I do, I hopefully that I speak for the people on our dais that their greatest achievements are due to, the, to your, your support and your encouragement of all of their efforts and endeavors. Now please, please, please plan on attending our next awards presentation in September of 96, where we'll all expect a full report from each and every one of you guys to see what you've been doing for the past year. And for everyone on the panel, thank you, thank you so much for coming. God bless and good night.